Hey guys, Nate here. Be sure to check out tomorrow's episode of the DeejCast where we talk to John and Doug, the creators of Kids on Bikes. Find it on Apple Podcasts or Spreaker. They'll, they'll give you Dunkaroos. You love Dunkaroos, right? <sighs> Dunkaroos. <laughs> Pickle Dunkaroos. <laughs> Okay, so you're back home. There's like all this, like some sen- this senior loons goons hanging around. Uh, Sean's on his way to the hospital with the uh, Brecken Breckenheimers, Breckenheimers, Breckenheimers the, the, with Mr. and Mrs. Breckenheimer. And this is this is home base to minus digits. Home base. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> so awesome. Then Doctor. Nelson Nelson, MD. Dr. Senior. Nelson Nelson, Senior, MD. Thank you. Made up the grid. Is on his way to the lab. With a pen and a pad. So, you get to the school, and you look over your shoulder, and you see all the way, like, towards the end of the road, there's just a black van facing the direction of the school. <sighs> So, man, like the headlights are off. So I'm gonna walk into the school. There's no lights on in the school, right? Just uh, like super dim ones, just like the. Is like it locked or ones. unlocked? So it's oh, it's locked, but you you have access. All right. So I. So it's an electronic lock. So or well, is it a key lock? You have a key. They, they know okay. you need to use the library after hours. Okay, of course. Why do they trust him? <laughs> so I'm gonna lock it behind me, and then I'm gonna discreetly peer out the window at the van. Does it have a license plate on it? It doesn't. Okay. Windows, windshields tinted? Mm-hmm. You're just watching the van? Yeah. You see the doors open. Okay. You yeah. Guys in suits get out. And start walking towards the school. Okay, so I'm freaking out, man. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna try to go out the back. Do they all leave the car? So, well, from what you can tell, there are two people okay. coming out of the car. The dr- okay. Whoever was sitting in the driver's seat gets out of the car. Yep. Yeah, driver and passenger. Okay. So, I'm gonna go around the school, out back, try to circle around and get into the car and start searching for stuff in there. Okay. Um, so, this, uh, will, this will definitely be a check. Uh, I'll roll flight okay yeah for being particularly evasive three excellent (laughs) so you get you get to the back of the van and the door is open at you and you see pita peck with an assault rifle And what's his deal? He's the Peter dude. P- Peter Peck the is with the, the arms. It's Peter is the woman. Oh. And and Peter is, okay, is sorry. the man. That's not so the, the 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 army dude or the armed guy is uh, mother. Uh yeah yeah okay, okay. yeah. What are you doing? So she she's like mean mugging you. You've been sticking your nose places it doesn't belong. Mr. Nelson. What's in it for you? So, and you look you look past her, and <laughs> you see that there are, are pickle jars, iron ore, and a container labeled argon. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I have a flashlight on me. All right. So I'm going to um, wait. So say what? Are, what are the objects again? Argon in glass jars. So, so you see, yeah, glass jars labeled argon. You see iron, iron ore, <coughs> and you just see stuff pickled. <laughs> Like pickled in a glass jar, or mm. okay. 
including human flesh in pickle jars. Okay. Each <laughs> knows human flesh. So... <coughs> it's some of his tattoo. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You may even recognize the forearm. Except the shirt sneakers. <laughs> yeah. No, those are back on my hand. I'm gonna roll a grit eight and <clears throat> try to squeeze her for any information I can. Um, how'd you get involved in this? Well, so, I guess it doesn't hurt to tell you before your demise. The government approached us. They knew that we had the iron ore, and they knew that we had the pickle juice. But then they added the argon, and they're paying us to experiment with all of it. What's <laughs> in it for you? I get boatloads of cash. Is there anything more important? The truth. I suppose not. Where do they take it all? They're, <laughs> they're doing the experiments underground, in the mine. What about the town? The town's been paid off. What could happen to it? Well, the citizens will very slowly disappear or develop strange powers. Okay. So I'm going to take my flashlight. Uh, so since there's common bear attacks, is it reasonable to say I have bear mace on me? <laughs> Prepared. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Glad specifically bear mates. Yeah. So I'm going to. Uh, Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> uh, make like. So I'll come quietly, slowly raise my hands, and attempt to spray her in the face uh, with bear mace. Okay. Um. I guess I'll roll a flight for it. Yeah, I agree with that. Nine? Okay, so... So you start walking up closely. Yep. And from your sleeve, whip up the bear mace and quickly spray her. And as you turn, she just starts firing wildly. Okay. And she just catches one in, in your calf, but you're like limping away and she's still just totally blind firing into the air. So I also, if I can, want to turn and throw my flashlight at the glass containers to try and shatter some of them. Okay. I'll roll flight for that as well. Yeah. Five? Okay, so, so you toss it and it, it ends up just like hitting her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the She's in the back, right? Like in the trunk? Yeah, so it's it's just like a like a moving van with like a ton of space. And yep. Yeah, and the back She's... opened up to to okay. you. Okay. So I'm going to try to hop in the driver's seat and step on the gas as hard as I can to try and dump her out the back as I also escape in the van. Okay, so so you limp over with uh the bullet in your in your calf and let's see. So, check to roll for this. I'd say, I'd say that this is actually like a brain move, I think. Okay. Like this is an intelligent way to get away from her. You know how to drive. 14? Yeah, so, so, you, <laughs> yeah, so, you, so you slam on the gas and you like quickly like cut, cut it. So she goes, she goes swinging out and then like is like firing just like at the back of the car. So then, then you start speeding off, and you see coming from the other way, it's old Cranky Butts, is coming in from from the east, and he's he's like driving towards you, and he's he's just kind of like looking at you. I avoid him, but I'm getting the hell out of yeah, there. Yeah, and the windows are tinted. Yeah. So, so he, just, he has no idea. Yeah. No, I just keep going. Okay. I don't know who's in it and who's not. So I can't trust anyone. <laughs> all right. So where would you take drivers in? Uh, to find my son first. Okay, so you're driving home. Yeah. Okay. So, so you speed back into like the residential area, 
and I, you're like you've clearly been shot. No, I yeah, I'm probably yeah. In, in the kitchen just making like mac and cheese or something, something to feed myself. Yeah. You know? Dad's not here to feed me. So I like smash up onto the lawn <laughs> with the van. I probably hear that and just like Help? stagger out. No! Just open the windows like, where the hell did you get a van? There's no time to ask. We're in danger. Get out of the house. What? <laughs> get out of the house. You have to come with me now. This is amazing. <laughs> The government! The government's <laughs> astronauts! It's the typical stuff that you do not believe at all. Yeah, this is this is just another Friday for Nelly. <laughs> Except there's a vehicle now. <laughs> and I'll roll, uh... Dad, I think you might be in trouble this time. Did you steal that van? I'm gonna roll broad. No questions! Five. We're in danger! You're trying to intimidate him? Yeah, I'm trying to be stern with him. Alright, so it's a roll of grit. Grit, okay. Oh, okay, Dad. Okay, I wasn't hungry anyway, let's go. Yeah, maybe because he's shot, it's more believable than. Is Nelly wearing a belt? Yeah. Yeah, probably. Alright. Oh, no, no. The bright jumpsuit. Oh, yeah, no, it's all it's all spandex. Yeah. <laughs> not, not spandex, yeah, spandex waist. Okay. So I'm gonna look for an article of cloth to tie off my calf, cut the blood circulation. Okay, so at this point, some neighbors come out once again. Like, What's happening now? Get out of here! <laughs> Nobody's safe. There's trouble going down at the mine. You're all in danger. So there are a few people who work at the mine. What, what are you talking about? We we've been done with work for hours. It's, uh, it, the government, the government's producing something at the mine. It's gonna kill you all. And wait, Chad's actually at home, so you're hearing all of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's been such a hard night for me, and all this racket again. I walk outside, and of course it's Mr. Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Please, you have to believe me. Nelly, what's going on, bro? I. I don't, my dad stole a car, somebody shot him, he's rambling The government shot me! Oh, I, no government is shooting you, dude. At this point, Timmy Taxel comes out of his house, totally in like, complete belief the government is out to get them. Timmy, get back in the house! <laughs> he like, he, he runs up with, with the belt. Timmy, oh my goodness! <laughs> of course, of course, Mr. Nelson! We gotta got rid of ourselves of the government. Listen, Timmy, you gotta get out of here. It's not safe. Oh, it's shit, you shot? <laughs> T Timmy, at this point, pushes one of the geezers off a motorcycle and steals it. And just starts speeding Go, out of town. Timmy! <laughs> Timmy just speeds off. It's off. <laughs> Timmy, he's eight years old. <laughs> no, Timmy's 14. He is 14. But so he's only 4'5. Can he even, like, drive the thing? <laughs> so I'm gonna try to get Nelly in the car and then go to the local broadcast station and try to go on radio and alert the whole town in danger. <laughs> Alright, that's at the town center. Yep. Gotta okay. do it. Gotta do it. Do you even know how to drive road. this, Dad? No, you're right, son. You should drive. You're right! <laughs> that is clearly the into. <laughs> oh, bro, I'll drive. No, 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 no. I got this. <laughs> no, no, Chad should drive. He's right. <laughs> so you're, you're all using the van still? Yeah. Okay. Me I guess I well, the Camaro's not going shovel, anywhere. Yeah. I shove the crazy lunatic off to the side. Where are we going? Uh, to the radio station. We have to get the news out. The whole town's in danger. Is that north? You don't know where the center town is. <laughs> I don't know, last time you shouted me to go north, so I did. East. Oh, okay, alright, let's go. Look to the east. Look on the Friday, look to the east. I start your mouth. Alright, so you're speeding to the east. I guess. So, so you're speeding that way. Um, it's So the radio station's right next to the, the like hospital thing. Um... So now you're still just screaming, belligerently, like flying up to this thing, like you're. So you're bleeding from your ankle, uh, your calf. 
Yeah. Um, I'm gonna tell Nelly to search the car for guns or anything else that might be in there. <laughs> the eight-year-old team. Search the guns. You got it. <laughs> Any anything you say, Dad. So there there are lock boxes that are like clearly made for pistols. Oh. Found a Glock. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to me. Doctor Idea comes comes out of the, the front wing. <laughs> and the eight year old told him the gun. <laughs> uh, I follow behind Doctor Audet with my hand all it's in, you, hand you, you just come out. It's yeah. I was like, what are you guys doing here? Yeah, your hand's totally numb now. He's shot it up with good stuff. Where'd you get a gun? It's a toy. <laughs> it doesn't look like a toy. Doc, it is, Doc. Get, get this man a gun. <laughs> Doc. What? <laughs> what? Doc, you gotta believe me. The, the, the mine, the mine, the town's in danger. I have to let the people know we have to evacuate. Dad, what if the doc's in it? <laughs> <laughs> Bro. Doc, Dr. Adet is one of these. Like, no, I, I'm only here to help people. Let me get that bullet out of your cap. That's exactly what one of them would say. <laughs> There's no time. We have to get the broadcast out. Get us into the broadcast station. Or, or, I mean, I don't operate that, but like, go ahead, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna barrel forward. So you're just like to, you're yeah. just like limping. You're like bleeding out. <laughs> I'm just following him, holding the gun in two hands. It's yeah, eight. It's eight, yeah. This little eight-year-old like well, with the gun. I'm I'm leaning on Chad. <laughs> And I look at my parents and I go, Mom, Dad, can I go play? <laughs> yeah, so then your, your parents are like, I don't know if you should hang out with them anymore. <laughs> Listen to me, you have to get out of here. Are they yelling at me at this point, too? Because, like, I'm the one who drove these two bags. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they kind of, they, like, expect you to make, like, level-headed decisions. So they're like... Oh, I'm reckless, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> they expect better of you. You always disappoint. Yeah, them. you always disappoint. <laughs> uh, so, so they, they're basically they're like, we we gotta get Sean out of here. Like this is a war zone. <laughs> <laughs> like Sean, get in the car. We're getting out of here. <laughs> flee, what, 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 flee for your lives. <laughs> no, Mr. Nelson's gonna handle his son. All right, <laughs> we gotta get out of here. Oh, I always get dragged away from the fun. <laughs> So, uh, so then at this point, at at the radio station, you're like running by them. Everything's in clear view of each other. It's like town hall circle. Yeah. So then coming out of the radio station, you see Mayor Jombie, super jacked in his like super muscular, like tight suit. What's going on here? Yeah, he's oh, bro, nice muscles, him. but we got a government conspiracy going on here. <laughs> You don't say. Pulls out an Uzi. I shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, dude, I thought you said that was just a toy. <laughs> That's my boy. <laughs> All right, so. Are you, sorry, so you're firing as a means of. Probably flight when I see him pull another gun. Yep, yeah, so just quick draw. Uh, oh my god. All right. Uh, That's a oh. 13. <laughs> From right between the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so... So you shoot him, it hits him square in the chest. And he goes, ooh! And he falls over, and you don't see any blood splatter. What? See, it's a toy! <laughs> that was really loud, though! He's, he's groaning, though. Ugh. Ugh, those pecs. So I'm gonna like stumble over to him and try to take the gun out of his hand. Okay, roll. Brawn, I suppose? Yeah, just like pry it away from him. Yeah. I, you want me to try? <laughs> you can help. I'll help. Yeah, say, so you help him. <laughs> Four. Okay. Alright, so you're telling him you're to go along with this. Oh, yeah, I'm going along with it. You're going along with it? Alright. I don't want a gun pointed at me. Yeah. I don't care who it is. Okay, yeah, so now you, you roll your brawn. Oh, okay. Team brawn. 18, there you go. Oh, man. It's yeah. 19. So you grab, and then it's like, oh, you know, you know that this is a strong dude, and you just reach down and you rip it out of his hands. And then you just have the total upper hand. He's like, oh, 
you, you see, like, close up, he's probably wearing a vest. And so you have, you just have the Uzi, and you're just over him, holding him, like, steady. Bro, what's going on? Tell me everything right now! Yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> spill the Nelly, beans. Nelly, what's going on? Dude, I just shot the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you, but that sounds awesome. It was. <laughs> I've never felt so powerful than holding a gun. <laughs> Get this kid into the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm screaming at him to tell me everything. Yeah. So, we, we've been combining the iron with our god and the pickle juice. What? And it spells fear. Uh, you stole my research. We've been... We've been mind controlling the town into becoming obsessed with pickles. And we've been. <laughs> That's why we've been so successful with pickling dunkaroos. <laughs> it's insane! Nobody pickles dunkaroos! They disintegrate! <laughs> so. Yeah, all you're left with is the plastic container. It's so wasteful. I'm, I'm gonna stumble back to the van. Who doesn't like pickled plastic? And take out one of the jars of pickled grossness. And I'm gonna walk back and force feed it to him. No! No! Order up. <laughs> Bro, you're gonna eat it. So yeah, so you have him, you're in like your power position. Oh, yeah. You're like forcing to open his mouth. It's like, no, no! And so you're just dumping the pickle juice down his throat. What is wrong with us? So you just you just see his, his like pupils dilate, and he's just like, Ugh! and he just starts grunting in fear of you. I'm just gonna feed it to him, and then I'm gonna get to the, and then I'm gonna like continue on to the broadcast and try to get. The message out. All right, so the people. Um, you've lost a ton of blood at this point. Meanwhile, I'm going to very far away tap the invisible card. Okay. So is he not invisible anymore? It's it's you ultimately have control of that. Okay. <laughs> Nate's uh, recommending that he, he reveal himself. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fine. After you. Yeah. Okay. So he appears next. Ne probably. Right next to uh, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson. Dr. Nelson! Oh! Oh, my boy, are you alright? And it, he's completely trusting him. You're right, yeah. And he looks, he looks down at the mayor. I look at Chad and I tell him. The year old just puts the clock up to his temple. <laughs> Bro, I'm not gonna shoot him. So, but it's it's clear that he hates the mayor. Yeah. Yeah, so you've lost a ton of blood. You wanna like climb up like into yeah, the Yeah, I'm trying to like, get up there and get the message out. The people have to know. So at that at that point, then where he's completely trusting in you, say like he would help you okay. to get the rest yeah. of the way while you hold the mayor hostage. Yep. <laughs> yeah, sound good. Yeah. 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 This checks out. <laughs> okay, so so he helps you get up to the tower. You start radioing. Emergency broadcast for the townspeople. For the last undetermined amount of time, the government has been combining iron and argon to create fear. <laughs> Pickled fear. You've all become addicted to it. It's affecting your minds. You have to vacate. Get out of the town. Get out. So then, at this point, you hear a radio back over. Roger that. This is the Lynxfield police. We've been suspecting for some time that there's been some shady business going on over in Winnetucket. And we knew it had to do with the pickles because of your research, Dr. Nelson. Please, they stole it. I never knew. I'm just looking for the truth. We're gonna send choppers to help. 
Please don't hurt my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to hang on. I just lost I so much Dr. blood. I knew Dr. was a genius. <laughs> yes. So, so like the whole town's listening to to this broadcast, and all of a sudden it's all just becoming clear. Like, why have we been all obsessed with pickles <laughs> and pickled stuff? Pickles suck. Pickles suck. <laughs> Pickle. <laughs> they like, should have known. Pickled fluff and peanut butter. It makes no sense. So all of a sudden, like, there, the mind control is being lifted, where the the truth is getting through and reconnecting the the pickled neurons. Yeah, the pickled <laughs> neurons. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's just a chain reaction. People are like, no, the pickles are no good. So everybody just vomits on that. All, yeah, all, so all sorts of towns like spread the emergency broadcast, and the, like the military shows up and holds the place, and they take like the pickle palace down, and they like arrest all those people. There is everybody involved with the pickle people. They arrest the town officials, and like it's like you find out it's reached like the whole tri county area, but like so like the whole state has to be like the major state, uh, and like FBI come in, yeah. and and so Doctor Nelson. And Chad and Sean and Nelson Jr. have thus saved Winnetucket from, and if not the entire country, Go Bears! From pickled fear. <laughs> Go Bears! Hooray! So, Tony, what did you think of Kids on Bikes? Uh, well, I thought it was a lot of fun, honestly. Uh, uh, what did you think about Kids on Bikes? I thought it was really cool. Um, I know there wasn't really a whole lot of combat, which is fine. I'm not... Um, Mr. Super Combat. What did you think of Kids on Bikes? I enjoyed it. A lot of my gaming experience is more Dungeon Dragons, Pathfinder, so having a more simplistic system um, where it's more role-playing is, is always a lot of fun. Um, the role-playing was great, a lot of fun. Um, Conrad did a great job of leading us kind of in the right direction, kind of in the right direction, <laughs> as we derail his whole story, but that's fine. Um, Easy to pick up. Um, it's not a really complex gaming system. But at the same time, because it's simple, it, it, it doesn't limit you either, so you can still be really creative with it. The system sets it up for super easy, quick character creation, which is awesome, especially if you want to just do a one-shot quickly for like a, a weekend, or just a you know, gathering of friends. The system was really easy to learn, um, it was very simple which is nice, you can just get into a whole, you know, get into a one shot like we did just now. But I was just saying that restrictions free creativity, um, so I found that was the case and it lets you focus on your gameplay, uh, just makes it a ton of fun. You can always react to a different situation in a crazy way and turn the whole game on its head, which is what I love about these games. Um, and I think the, the pamphlet and the, uh, the rules came with pre-written characters that are ready to go too, so even if you don't want to make your own character, you have a pile of characters you can just take and make your own, which is always fun. Um, but yeah, as far as the uh, the game system itself, um, it was easy, honestly, I didn't read any of the rules before coming here today, so I was going in completely blind, and it was super easy to make up, and it was really no trouble at all, it was, it was a lot of fun. So to talk to the therapy of it, I think one thing that's really cool about it. Players themselves can be all ages while then role-playing characters of all ages. Yep. So it allows children, you know, to be in the driver's seat of some sort of challenge that's within the town, something to solve. Yeah, something they may not be able to do in real life. Like, you know, a kid may end up wanting to role-play as an adult. They, they're they the ones in the driver's seat for the first time in their lives. Um, and it also allows like an adult to kind of go back and have more of like a childlike mind. It was really cool playing Sean Breckenheimer, just this really scrappy little kid. And I had to kind of just try to think like a kid, just fun. It's something I don't do at 31 years old. Right, and that's the cool thing about the tropes too, is that you have these strengths, but you also have weaknesses yeah. with, within each trope. And it gives you a list to choose from or you kind of make up your own, but you're, you're flawed people and you get to see different perspectives. A child playing the blue collar worker, which, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they have parents, you know, in those roles yep. and they get to then role play that and kind of see through their eyes a little bit more right. and, you know, create an understanding. Another thing that's really cool is violence is basically always bad. You know, even though you have brawn and you have fight as checks, 
it's always dangerous. Like they explicitly say in the rules, you know, like you can be just kind of messing around and somebody falls the wrong way and they break their arm. It really puts you in a position to come up with creative solutions to things, you know, especially with like Marvel movies right now, you know, like they have powers, they fight, you know, yep. and they, they overcome these things where... With where in this, you're just your regular everyday normal people and you have to come up with challenges to to try and, in some cases, figure out supernatural problems. Right, and, you know? and the characters you play as are capable of doing that. So in, in this game, you know, we had this you know child who only spoke in grunts, but was very clearly super powered where he could change his density and disappear you know, and, and become invisible and- Eat he, my rabbit. Right, he was- Oh, he fed. He was odd. You know, to say the least, but then you have to figure out how to interact with odd people. That's just the nature of the world. Yeah, that, yeah that's true. Especially once you get to the workforce. <laughs> right. You know, language could very easily go over your head, even if, you know, they're speaking the same language as you. That's, I think that the the character only speaking in grunts, really, you know, all right, so how, how do I think non-verbally? Yeah. Uh, like, like, for example, when I was trying to, like, draw the bunny out, you know, I had to first think, like, okay, how do I draw the bunny out? But then I used kind of that same t mentality to, to speak with the powered character for the first time and, you know, get him to come towards me and, and trust us. So, you know, which was... Definitely was a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge. Try to think outside the box to, you know, how do I communicate with this person that can't communicate back with me? It was a. Uh it was cool to like have to try and access that part of my brain. Yeah, and I, and I thought the approach was good, which is why, you know, as the game asked, I rewarded that by having him come. You're trying something that made sense to me, you know, that you... Right. It's like, okay, you know, like, we're calm, we're friendly, you know, like the the gestures and the posture and even even if he wasn't speaking that way as the character, you know, we could still see it like in in your face, I could see, you know, like, all right, we're calm, you know, come okay. come to it's me, right. it's it's safe. And those nonverbals mean a lot, you know, well, communication is a lot of nonverbal. Oh yeah. And that, you know, those kind gestures I think helps in in groups and, and therapy, you know, especially working with children with behavioral type stuff you know, the right posture and the right expression and learning those things. The right body language. Right. You know? I mean, like body language is huge. You know, I mean, you, you can tell a lot just by, you know, their posture or the look on their face. I think another thing that's that's cool for the, the therapy part is the town always takes place before cell phones, especially now with, you know, the, the rise in cell phones and... You know, there's studies where, you know, children using cell phones prior to age five, the development in gray matter is, you know, decreasing. And that's, you know, kind of that upper cognitive ability. This game is saying, okay, how do we solve things without cell phones? The playing of the game, I think it's important too to say, you know, like cell phones away. We're going to simulate that both, you know, in real life and as the characters, you know, put, put the cell phones down. Sam. Interview the Lumberjacks about... Hey, this is Rob Martin. Hi, Rob. <laughs> and don't look at that as your get-out-of-jail-free card. You know, look at other <laughs> means right. of surviving on your own without, you know, a device that just tells you everything. Right. I mean, you know, we're so used to just having the world at our fingertips. I mean, you want, you want to know something, you take your phone, you open it up, you Google it. This game, you can't, you know, it's not like, it's like, oh, I take out my phone and I Google this. Um, you actually have to think about what it was like, you know, before everybody had the world's knowledge at their fingertips. We're old enough where we remember that. But at the same time, it's really hard to think about a world where I can't just take my cell phone out of my pocket and figure out, oh man, there was this actor in this movie and who was it? And, you know, oh yeah, it was uh, Lawrence Fishburne. It's, it's kind of cool to have to like go back and really kind of think outside the box, you know, and what it's like in a world that people don't have the world's information right at their fingertips. And kind of going back to the communication aspect too is where you also have this camera on you built in with the phone now in the game you can't just say you know all right i'll take a, a picture of that and then i will show it to you know the, my fellow player here you have to actually communicate what that is describe it you know and use advanced language to try to conjure up this picture for the other players if they're not present, which, which happened, you know? Yeah, and actually I was just going to say, like, I and I liked the way that was handled because, you know, um, Nelson Nelson Sr. wanted to have that camera on him to take a picture of 
yellow and the silver material or whatever it was on the floor. And like, that was the first thing that went through my mind. I was like, dude, no, no cameras. But then at the same time, Nelson Nelson Sr. would absolutely have a camera in his backpack. Just, you know, thinking about that character, how eccentric he is, how he's always focused on his research and all this stuff, he would absolutely have one of those little Kodak disposable cameras in his backpack to take pictures of stupid little things that he finds. So I like the way that that ended up working out because yes, it did go against the, the rules of the game, but at the same time, we did it in such a way where stuck with the time period and it was a disposal camera, not a digital camera or anything like that. You know, he would have had to go and get them developed and all the stuff to show us these pictures. Whereas, you know, on like a cell phone or a digital camera, you can just look. Yeah, and I mean, Mr. Lindbergh is... Uh, My dad. You know, he's, he's a photographer. So we know that, you know, when we were 10 years old, he had his camera on him. All the time. So, you know... Still does. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely feasible that Nelson Sr. there would, would have his camera. But, but as you said, you know, it wasn't just, I'll take a picture of this and then we'll figure it out based on that. The players started testing things, you know, like, oh, okay. Scientific well, method. And, you know, yeah. yeah. Let's see, like, what happens when I, you know, put this into uh, this and... You know, like, does it have a particular odor? And so using metal, using plastic, using cloth, all these different materials. And then it's, you know, my job to properly relay how they would be affected by this, you know, acid and mercury and what they actually, these things were. Exactly. Another thing that I really like is the investment in the game where everybody really seemed to create characters that they loved. Generally, when you're playing kids on bikes, you know, it's it's a, a community build as kind of touched on at the beginning, you know, Nate comes up with the name of the town and then, you know, Tony came up with, you know, the school mascot or something. And those types of things, you know, allow you to become invested in, in the world that you're trying to, to save. And, and not just that, but at least our group, we, we came up with some characters that were just really cool to get invested. Like to the two Nelson, they just, the, the dynamic that they had, it was, it was just really cool to watch, really cool to, to see. And then obviously you had the dynamic between, you know, me and Sam, Sean Breckenheimer, Chad Breckenheimer. You had that big brother, little brother aspect. I really did. I got so invested in these characters that like by the end of it, I was like, no, I want to keep going. Yeah. And you establish those types of relationships. So even if you're, you know, doing a group where people, you know, don't know each other that well, it's, it's cool in kids on bikes where it's like, all right, how, how do you know this person and why you're friendly or neutral or enemies by establishing those, you know, types of rules then that can really help with, you know, again, communication and where Nate and Sam had brotherly love, you know, it was both, it was conflict and love, you know, like it, yep. at some points it impeded, you know, Nate from like, he wanted to get right in on this crazy research and stuff. And then I get dragged away and he throws me in his car and I had, I'm like, no. Right. And ultimately, you know, that's again, how the world works. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're simulating real relationships I, I thought that was, you know, a healthy relationship there where mm -hmm. it's genuinely cared what happened to his little brother. Uh, and, and not just his little brother, but his little brother's friend with right. you know, with, with uh, Nelson Nelson Jr. And that's, I think it's a really cool thing about Kids on Bikes where you, you build that right from the start. The biggest challenge, I think, with creating the world setting... I personally have a you know, background in like the fantastical and with Dungeons and Dragons and, and Star Wars and all these different things where you are powered heroes, essentially. And they have these, you know, checks 15, 20, 10, these difficulty checks. And, you know, you kind of meet them or you don't. Where I like a, use, the, use the example of, okay, I'm going to jump over a cliff, you know, for some sort of barbarian or ranger or something who's like, you know, in great shape and sprinting. That's not really that big of a deal. And I can pretty easily come up with checks for that. But now, okay, this is a 10 year old kid, uh, probably has some sort of fear of heights and the difficulty has to be pretty precise, I think, especially where you then look at the, the difference in the role. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I, I fail by one or I fail by four, those are different outcomes as opposed to either you fail or critically fail, or you succeed or critically succeed in, you know, kind of standard Dungeons and Dragons. You know, I sit there, I'm like, oh, it's like a 13, you know, for, for this check. Then where I have to come up with these, these slight differences. I think that was 
the biggest challenge I came across. But ultimately, I still wanted to kind of reward the players. So then sometimes right. you fudge the numbers a little bit. But Kids on Bikes does a good job too, where if you do fail, it's just the narrative. Like you get these adversity tokens. Failing isn't necessarily bad. So that kind of, you know, mitigates that out. challenge. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing that I thought was, was a bit of a challenge was e- extending the time of play in a game like Dungeons and Dragons, where you have, you actually go into a dungeon and you simulate combat that, that in itself could ultimately take an hour right there. Mm-hmm. As opposed to here, the, the, the combat check was, oh, vice principal Geraldine's coming with their ruler. And then he says, and I'm like, I don't think so. Yep. I'm faster than you. And that, and that was ultimately it. You know, that was like a whole battle scene that's done now. You know, like it's, yep. that happened. So having like a really long session, you have to do a lot on the fly. So I think it really is important for the players to be really invested and and know the town and and the characters. The players themselves can sort of help extend. The time yep. of play. So what I really liked best about the way this whole narrative played out. So I, in advance, had had plans for some big company to have come in and sort of underhandedly taken the mining rights underneath the town where they already have this iron, you know, uh, excavation plant and, and everything, but they didn't know about all the sulfite mining. And I kind of planted that clue really early in the game with with Dr. Audette, you know, talking about, uh, you know, oxidization and, and the pyrite. pyrite and, yeah, right. The yeah. pyrite. The pyrite. <laughs> pyrite? What's pyrite? Like, vous français? Or, oh. I, yeah, pyrite, <laughs> vous français. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll be right after this point. Bonjour. Pyrite, va vous français. It was really cool how... I, you know, I didn't plan for for Dan to play this really insane guy. So I made that detour, you know, narratively to just, I thought, all right, all right, there's all this investment in this really weird guy, his research and his studies. He obviously was really into it. Nate's character really wanted to be a part of it. Tony's character, even though he, he was ashamed, but he had a strong reaction to it. Right. So I, I felt that bringing that full circle with just sort of sidestepping this, this big company, having it be, you know, a government conspiracy, and then taking those, those elements that don't really make any sense in actuality of, right, of in my real control, world, right. but I thought it was a great way to reward the players for wh- what they were doing. And which, which I think is a good point. I mean, I feel like a good GM has to be able to kind of roll with the punches like that. You know, I mean, you had this whole plan set out and then it was like, you know what? I could keep doing this. But I think the game would be better, and I think the players would have more fun if we just rolled with the narrative as is. And I feel like Kids on Bikes really lends itself to that, because where it is storytelling, it is group storytelling. You know, if the GM does have a set, like, story or a set thing, um, you know, it may not be what you end up getting to, because the story that the players come up with might be better than what you came up with. Might not be, but they may have more have more fun with it. Right. Yeah, I think that's really the, the point, is if... People are, are bold or, you know, things don't necessarily go their way or there's there's just some aspect of what's happening that really grabs their attention. As a storyteller, you know, to bring that full circle and you can kind of go two ways. You know, it's like I, I conclude this by having them just be total buffoons and he actually was insane and none mm-hmm. of this mattered. But the conclusion of having it actually be what they were talking about really captivates people and will have them come back for more. If uh, you at home, you know, you like the video and I will post my personal notes on our website, deechtime.com uh, and on Facebook and, you know, on all of our other accounts that we'll eventually have. So Which my- we should actually have by the time this video releases. That's true. So my, my personal notes will be on there uh, and you can watch this video and kind of go from there. So continuing on, my my first thought is that the this pickle phenomenon and this mind control experiment is is actually nationwide. And we kind of backtrack a little bit with, you know, him talking, like sending out the broadcast, like beware. Either new players have to then kind of deal with the fallout of this um, or the same players go on and now it's their personal mission to save other towns from... From the government. Yeah, from, from the government. But from these mind control experiments. And even if it's not, you know, exactly the same where it's, you know, pickling. Uh, but some sort of, 
you know, following the vein, you know, like where these, mm -hmm. these people are involved and in getting big bucks for these experiments and just sort of pursuing that in the next town over or right. the next state over or some other faction in the, in the government who's opposed to this faction. It's like, all right, we got to call in Nelson, Nelson. To, oh, man. To, to advise our, you know, the, the, the team we send in. Uh, and so I think the president's like, get me Nelson, Nelson Sr. now. <laughs> and then in itself, that could be the grand finale. If you go, uh, yeah. go for a while, eventually you get all the way up to, you know, the president, you know, needs these people to personally save the, the rest of the country from whatever's going on. If you guys end up wanting us to continue on with Kids on Bikes, maybe continue on with the story, shoot us a DM on Twitter uh, or you know Facebook, what have you. Just let us know. Let us know you want to see more because I really enjoyed Kids on Bikes. I would love to reprise the role of Sean Breckenheimer. I would love nothing more than to see the roles of Nelson Nelson uh, Jr. and Sr. come back. And I'll even take my brother. I'll take, I'll take Chad Breckenheimer too. Why not? <laughs> All right. Right. And that can be, you know... A week later, a month later, maybe a few years later. Yeah. You know, we're teenagers now. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and we can just show growth of character. Yeah. And, you know. So that was Kids on Bikes. Uh, let us know in the comments below or, you know, any one of our other social media platforms what you liked, what you didn't like, what you might like to see in the future. But for Deej Time, I'm Nate. That's Conrad. You stay classy, YouTube. And have a good night, YouTube. But mostly stay classy. Have a good night. But stay classy. Have the best night. Have a classy night. <laughs> <laughs>